Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of service, holiday season is afoot, right? We're right around the corner from Thanksgiving, and then it's a stone's throw to Christmas, and everything goes bonkers. I don't know how holidays are going to look this year with, uh, you know, coronavirus around. You may be going to a smaller gathering than you're used to. You may be doing your online shopping. I'm not quite sure. One of the things that I'll miss is almost every Thanksgiving and Christmas, we've been able to be with family. And you know how family goes, right? When you're sitting in the room night after night, at least one of those nights that you're together turns to like silly picking on each other and reminiscing and pulling out the, fi- the pictures that should have been thrown away immediately after they were developed in the 90s. Like you tell all the bad parts of your life and everybody has a collective laugh. Anybody do reminiscing like that when you get together as a family? Oh, I'll miss that moment. What's interesting to me is when we reminisce, when we think about the good old days of our life, how we kind of whitewash some of that stuff away, how we selectively remember, right? I mean, we do. It's not a bad thing, but usually we, we remember the good over the bad. Now, some of you in the room may be remembering the bad over the good today, and, and that's hard. I know what that's like. I think Jesus can help us with that, but usually we're selectively remembering the, the good over the bad. It's not necessarily a bad practice at all. The truth of the matter is all of us come from a history. None of us in this moment can say all of who we are and what we've done is simply our choice and our product. Like We come from a line of important decisions, not just ours, but our parents and their parents. Like We're a product, not simply of our own device, but of a history of people. That's the same story of Jesus. We like to think of him sometimes as just like an alien that dropped in from heaven, but there's a, there's a story that goes before it. There's the good old days of Israel, and I want to spend a few weeks leading up to Christmas kind of selectively covering some of the highlights of that story, the way any of us would reminisce. Now, it's interesting to me, Mark, Matthew, Mark, the second gospel in our, in our Bible is actually the first gospel written, and it's short, and it moves with blistering speed. Mark is all about introducing you to Jesus and taking you to the cross. Over and over again, if you read it, it's going to say, immediately this, immediately that. Like, it's a blistering speed. Matthew has something different in mind. Matthew still highlights the cross. He still highlights the resurrection. In fact, he gives us more stuff after the resurrection. But Matthew has a different intention. He wants us to do some remembering, some selective memory, some reminiscing about the good old days of Israel and the faith that we come from, because Jesus isn't just an alien from heaven. He's the product of a promise, and that promise came to the nation of Israel to bless the entire world. So here's how the gospel of Matthew opens up. It opens up with a genealogy that we usually just want to skip because it's boring. We're going to dive into it for a few weeks. Here's what it says. This is the record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David, a David. <laughs> David, and Abraham. And Abraham was the father of Isaac. Father Abraham had many sons. That's who we're talking about here. So why start with Abraham? I think this is an important question. Because if you just go a couple gospels later to the gospel of Luke, Luke goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. He wants to see how Christ ties to the foundations of our race and everything. Why does Matthew start with Abraham? Well, I think there's a few answers. The first one is this. If you read the end of chapter 1, you're going to see that Matthew is interested in setting up a kind of an equation almost, a mathematical formula. He wants to give you 14 generations here, 14 generations here, 14 generations here, show the perfection of Jesus' completion of the promise. So there's a little bit of fudging with the narrative and changing some people and changing some dates to try to make it fit that scheme. So maybe Abraham just helps the formula. I think it's more than that. Because Abraham is the person of promise. He's the founder of the nation of Israel, of a people. And it's the covenant that God has with Abraham that actually gets fulfilled in Jesus in the New Testament. So Matthew's interested in rooting what happens in Jesus and what happened with Abraham. And I think this is the final reason. If you're interested in getting people to place their faith in Jesus, which is all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they said, we're telling you this stuff so you'll believe in Jesus the one that God sent, the one who died for you and rose from the grave. Like, that's the guy you need to trust. And if you want to teach people to trust in Jesus, then you show them the archetype of faith, the person who trusted God when he didn't have any reason to do so. And that person is Father Abraham, who had many sons. 
So I want to dig into Abraham's story a little bit today. And one of the things that I like about the scriptures is it doesn't whitewash all of the bad stuff. It's going to include some of the, the twists and turns, the bad, not simply the good. And I think it makes us trust it a little bit more. So we're introduced to Abraham in Genesis, and we don't get to know anything about his history. We don't get to know his likes or dislikes. We don't know who his family is yet. We don't get to hear his ambitions, his hopes, or his, you know, excuses. Here's how we're introduced. He immediately hears a word from the Lord. And the Lord said to Abraham, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to a land that I'm going to send you to. And I'm going to make you a great nation. And, and I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who treat you with contempt. I got your back, is what God's saying. All the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you. So what does he do? He goes, <laughs> literally, right, up, right off the bat. We don't know anything else about him. We know, though, he's rooted in this area. He hears a word from God, and he goes. I can only imagine the conversation he had with his wife. Because he hears God in the story, not Sarah. So Shada was up here singing. She's my wife. Say hi, Shada. Shana has this thing. I'm throwing myself under the bus. <laughs> I know. So when Shana wants to share something that she's been thinking about with me, I'll walk into the room. There's usually some silence, and she's just kind of sitting there, and she'll say, so I've been thinking. And I'm like, brace for impact. And usually when she says that, she'll go, <laughs> like put her shoulders up and look at me with that grin, like a little bit nervous. And then she'll start pouring out the way that we need to spend money next time or something along those lines, right? She, she's got plans for us. You, you all do this as well. I, am at, I just can't help but separate or not separate my experience from this passage. I imagine in Genesis chapter 12, you know, Sarah's maybe outside the tent reminiscing with a cousin or something, like shooting the breeze, and then comes in and Abraham sitting on the couch with the TV off. And you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> this, is not, this is not normal. And then Abraham says, hey, Sarah, I've, so I've been thinking. What do you say we, we pack up shop, leave our family and our support system, go off into a distant land we've never, we've never been to because God said so? I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Right? If you're Abraham's wife, what are you thinking in that moment? I imagine she's like, did you get into the mushrooms behind the tree, like back behind the tent or something? Like, what are you talking about? You heard from God. And just after one word, you're willing to sacrifice everything we've built here. Our family, my parents, your parents. We've never even been to that spot before. What are you talking about? Can you imagine the scene? Like, would you have gone? You're crazy. But Abraham's response is, I've heard from God. I've got to go. And I, I imagine Sarah was like, well, how can we even know we can trust God? In the ancient Near East, which is the area where they're from, there were all sorts of gods. You know some of them from mythology and different things. Like, you couldn't trust them. They were finicky. They would go back on their word. They were like, humans would like play things to them. But this God is different, and Abraham knows it, and Abraham trusts him. Here's what I want you to know today as a main point. Sometimes your trust in God is going to look like straight madness to other people. Those of you who are getting baptized today, you said, I'm trusting in Jesus no matter what, 100%, you can have my life. And some people are going to look at that, maybe even family members and close friends, and be like, you're nuts. What are you talking about? You heard from a God, and you're going to trust in him. Abraham's story is your story today. Because it sounds just like your salvation story, that God spoke to you, probably not you know, audibly, and he probably didn't tell you you need to move from point A to point B. But the Spirit of God, who you knew was him, put his finger on your heart and said, today's the day you trust me, and I've got big plans for you. Are you willing to leave the life of comfort and sin that you've got and adopt the life that I want to give to, to you and go to the places I want you to go? That's your story. And sometimes people are going to think, you're bonkers. Trust them anyway. Time and time again, actually, Abraham has to go through this trust loop. It doesn't just happen one time. You remember, he left his homeland. That's kind of the first one. I think that kind of symbolizes repentance, walking away from your old life and taking on a new one. But then there's more stories. Like, remember the time where Abraham has to take his son Isaac up the mountain and they have a tough conversation? 
Or how about the time that Abraham stumbles upon this priest named Melchizedek and gives him 10% of everything he owns? Like, there are these times where God speaks to Abraham throughout his life, throughout his story, and says, will you trust me in this? Not just will you trust me back there. Will you trust me today? Will you trust me now? Will you trust me with what I'm laying on your heart? In so many ways, I think Abraham's story echoes Jesus' story. Radical faith, radical trust, radical obedience. That's supposed to be your story as well. Radical trust, radical faith, radical obedience. Because Abraham is asked to offer up his son as a sacrifice. We'll cover this in just a minute. And he says, I'll trust Jesus in it. You know what? That's fulfilled when God the Father sends his own son as a sacrifice so that his promise could be fulfilled with you. Trust God, he always makes a way. This is how the book of Hebrews describes trust, by the way. It says, faith is or shows the reality of what we hope for. That is, you are a living embodiment, living awkwardly in the space of your future hope. You, living by faith today, are trusting something that hasn't happened yet. And it's evidence for people around you. So, the book of Hebrews continues to talk about Abraham's. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed God and called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land that God promised him, he lived there by faith too. It's a constant cycle. He was like a foreigner living in tents, and so did Isaac and Jacob who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Here's the second truth today. Faith is not just a moment. It's a lifestyle. It's not just an action. It's not just saying, I'm choosing to trust Jesus today and I'm giving my life. That's amazing. We're here to celebrate those exact decisions and moments today. But those moments have to turn into more moments. Those moments turn into a lifestyle. Today, that decision of faith to follow Jesus, yes, but you're jumping out of the starting gate into a race that we're running. We have to continue time after time after time to trust God. Abraham didn't just trust him when he left his original home. He trusted him every day through his life. So there's this moment, this really uncomfortable moment, a moment we don't even like to read or talk about in the book of Genesis, where God taps Abraham on the shoulder a little bit later in his life, through lots of ups and downs, by the way, at this point, on his journey. He says, hey, dude, do you trust me? And Abraham's like, of course I trust you. You've come through time and time again because at this point, he finally had the promise. He had his son Isaac, the one that they'd hoped for. And Abraham and Sarah, they loved that kid to death. Like he was their hope. He was their promise. He was God's gift. They loved him so much. And God said, hey, dude, do you trust me? He said, of course. Look what you've done in my life. How could I not trust you? He says, okay, great. Can I have your kid? And Abraham's like, like, you mean to play pitch and catch in your backyard or something? Like, you want to borrow him? <laughs> like you, you want to hold him for a moment while we clean up the dishes? Like, what are you talking about? You want my kid. And God's like, no, that's not what I'm talking about at all. Here's the, the, the scary story. Genesis 22, verse 2. Take your son, the only one you got, Isaac, the one you love so much. Can you, can, the repetition, like, He's your everything. Take your everything and go to the land of Moriah and go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I'll show you. What? You know what he does? He goes. Would you go? Would you do that? I mean, that's bonkers. I'm a pastor, okay? (laughs) That reads to me like a little bit nuts because this isn't an evil thing that God's asking him to leave behind. It's not a sinful behavior or a lifestyle. That's God's promise that came from him. It's God's righteousness. It was the end. But what? God, you gave this to me. Why would you want to have it back? This is a a painful, painful moment. But he goes. And I imagine the conversation between Abraham and his kid was a little bit weird. Like they're hiking up the mountain, and Isaac says, Hey, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And his daddy has to say, God's got this. I trust him. And then they get to the top, and they're making the fire, and things are getting real, and there's no sacrifice yet. And so Isaac has to say, hey, Dad, I mean, we're, like, where's the sacrifice? Like, do you have a delivery? Is there a door dash coming or something? Like, when's this thing going to get here? And his dad has to look at his son in the eyes and say, 
uh, I don't know, son, but God's got this. I trust him. And then it gets really real because the ropes get tight. This is binding him up, and he's laying his, his own son on the altar. And, and, and Isaac is having to look up at his dad in the eyes. There's crazy in those eyes. And I imagine Abraham lifting up that flint knife and saying, I trust him. God's got this. And he's about to plunge the knife into his own son, which is madness. It's insane. But you can see the trust that he has in God. And what happens is God shows up and says, wait, Abraham, hold the farm. I got you. Don't hurt your kid. And there's a sacrifice in the bush ready because God can be trusted. Sometimes those trials, those temptations, those those things that we go through in our life just seem bonkers. <sighs> Crazy, not just to everyone else around you, but to you. Here's what I want you to do. Trust God. He's got this. He's good. And he's going to make a way just like he did for Abraham. So those of you who are getting baptized today, you are putting that sort of radical trust in God. To say, I'm dying to my old life, and I'm being raised in the new, and I know that things are going to be hard. This doesn't get rid of every problem in my life. This doesn't erase, you know, some of the, the bad choices that I've made and their, their cascading effects in my family, all that jazz. Trust God. He's got you on the journey. Faith is not just a moment or an act. It's a lifestyle. Remember today that God's got you. So the writer of, Abra of Hebrews continues to reflect on Abraham's faith, saying this. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice to God as he was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him that Isaac was the son through whom all the descendants would be counted. Abraham reasoned, if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. That's your story today, too. When you trust God and you put your life of sin to death in the waters of baptism, you are trusting that he is willing and able to raise you to new life, new spiritual life, empowered by his Holy Spirit, that he can really, totally, substantially, and tangibly change your life for the better. He can, and he will, if you trust him. Now, let me get to the, the thing that you guys already know, and I want to lay it bare because it's just simply true. Sometimes your faith is going to fail you. In this moment, like that moment you gave your life to Christ, you were like, yes, I'm ready. I'll take on hell or high water. And you're going to feel like that too, those of you who are getting baptized today. Hang on to that faith, like that burning desire, that trust. But there are going to be times in your life where life throws you a curveball. And you don't respond the way you're supposed to. You don't trust God. You don't even trust yourself. You may not trust your spouse. You may not trust your church family. You all know things like this happen. Stuff comes and just blindsides us and takes us out, and we don't respond the way we thought we would. I love that the story of Jesus is prefigured in Abraham, radical faith and radical trust and radical obedience, but it also shows us the need for Jesus. Because Abraham is, even though he's the great one of the faith, he still has moments where his faith fails. Right after he leaves his family in Padam Aram and settles in Canaan, we get this annoying story where you're like, what are you talking about? I thought this was supposed to be the best dude. He, he wanders to Egypt because he gets to Canaan and there's a drought. You ever got to where you think you're supposed to be and it just doesn't feel right? <laughs> like things don't work out the way they're supposed to. So he has to go to Egypt. And when he goes to Egypt, he says, man, I'm a foreigner in this, in this place. And my, my wife, to her credit, she's smoking hot. <laughs> like if I, if I go here, and they know that I'm married to her. Like, I'm nothing to them. They might just kill me and take her as a wife. So he, he goes over to his wife and says, hey, Sarah, trust me. Don't trust God. Trust me in this. When we go to Egypt, don't tell anybody that I'm your husband. Just say that I'm your brother so that nobody kills us or anything. And then crazy things happen because Abraham's not willing to trust God through that hard moment. Now, you might be thinking, well, this was just right off the bat. It's like a, a person who gives their life to Jesus. Of course, they're going to struggle to maybe go back to some sinful behaviors, like, you know, to fall, to, you know, to do that thing again, cut them a break. We should cut them a break. You know why? Because God's grace is new every morning. But did you know that this isn't just a story of Abraham right after he first trusts Jesus, right after he first trusts God? This is a pattern. 
In fact, later on, way later in the story of ups and downs where God has blessed him and shown up time and time again and proved that he could trust him, we get another story in another kingdom, same song, different verse, where Abraham goes into another place and says, hey, Sarah, look, we've been through this before. I don't know, like the promise is with us. And if I die, God's promise dies. We can't risk that. So go ahead and tell him I'm your brother again. And the whole bad cycle happens again. That whole nation falls under God's curse. It's nuts. It's mayhem. There are times where even Abraham's faith fails. So here's the truth. If his faith can fail, yours can too. There just are going to be times where you're like, man, I totally missed the mark. I made a big decision without big prayer. I, uh, you know, I, I took a job and I'm way over my head. I, I started doing that thing again that I said I was never going to do. I said I was going to follow through with counseling with my spouse. And, you know, one session through there, I'm up the creek without a paddle. I'm out. There are going to be moments where your trust in God fails you, where you don't respond the way that you thought you would. There's a question that you're going to face in that moment. And that's, what am I going to do now? My faith has failed me. I'm back at square one, or so it seems. Like, I'm not who I thought I was. I made all these commitments, and I didn't follow through. I'm fighting with my spouse again. I'm drinking again. I'm doing all of these things. Like, what am I going to do? You know what the temptation is? It's to throw the faith game in the, like, just in, in the toilet. It's like, throw in the towel. I'm done with this. I'm done with this. My life has gone haywire. I can't trust God after all. Let me tell you the truth. You can still trust God, even when your life goes haywire. When you're tempted to give in, when you think you're way out of bounds, you screwed it up big time this time. There's no coming back. There's always coming back because there's grace for you. Every single day, every single moment, you're never too far gone. You can always come back and trust again. Here's this little verse in between that no one ever preaches. Listen to this. All these people, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, still believing what God had, or died, still believing what God had promised. They did not receive what had been promised, but they saw it from a distance and they welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who, uh, who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for a country they came from, though, they could have gone back. Do you hear that? Going back, throwing in the towel, starting back at square one, it's always an option for you. But listen to the option that they chose instead. But they were looking for a better place. Anybody looking for a better place? (laughs) A better life, a better hope. They were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That's why God was not ashamed to be called their God. Because he had prepared a city for them. All the men and women of our story so far in Genesis could have packed it up and gone home and said, I'm out. I failed. I failed, God. I can't come back. I'm I'm done. It was always an option. They didn't choose it because they knew they had their eyes fixed on something they hadn't received yet. They trusted God in faith that he was able to complete the work that he began in them, to follow through on his promise. No matter how far they'd gotten from him, God is always calling you back. There's always that call. Today, he might be saying, hey, will you trust me again? I don't care what happened last week. I don't care what happened in your failed marriage. I don't care about X, Y, or Z. What I care about is you and if you'll trust me today. Because here's the truth. Uh, This is the real truth. I told you a half truth, okay? Sometimes your faith will fail. True. But Christ won't. That's why we needed him. Abraham's faith failed. Your faith will fail. Jesus didn't. Tested and tried in every single way, follow through to the point of obedience, even to death on a, cry, a cross. And because of that, God resurrected him and enthroned him in heaven above every other king and every other ruler and every other problem, including your sin problem, your family problem, whatever you're facing. Your faith may fail in the moment. Christ won't. So trust him. It's never about your ability to trust him anyway or your ability to get through your ability to make your way through life. It's about God's ability to do it in you and through you and for you. So today, I just, I just think it's the case that God's asking, will you trust me again? Not just did you trust me back in the 80s or 90s. Not just are you going to trust me in this moment when you get baptized. But are you committed day after day, no matter 
how crazy life gets, no matter how far gone you go, no matter how like guilt-tripped you are inside, to say, I'll trust God. If so, His grace is ready for you today. <laughs> today. It's always new in Jesus. You can always trust Him. He is always enough. It's time to come.